It's the 12th District. I'm Kerry Condotta for NCW Life. Well, we've taken a look at some candidates over the past few months, and the race that is of most interest, I think, for people in Washington is the 8th Congressional District. It is going to be a real barn burner. Ton of money pouring into that race at this point. And you have uh, seen interviews on this show with all three of the Republican contenders. There is a fourth that uh, we're not that sure where or who it is, but <laughs> these are the three that are collecting money and look like they're the serious candidates. So today we wanted to do something a little different, and that is let you take a look at all three of them back to back. We're going to have a segment from each one of those interview shows for you, and uh, then you can uh, decide which direction you're going to go. And of course, again, if you can make it out June 5th to the Bianchi Vineyards, there will be a picnic with all of these folks speaking, and you'll also have the uh, opportunity to meet them in person. So keep that in mind. Uh, but for now, let's take a look at a segment from each of the top three contenders to run against Kim Schreier this fall in the 8th Congressional District. That's right. We we know the district is slightly more Republican than it is Democrat already, and a, a new it was re, redistricted. It's much better than it was. Uh, it leans Republican. Uh, Kim Schreier, uh, who moved from California and lives in King County, uh, has a 100% voting record with the Biden administration and Nancy Pelosi. 100%, not 99, but 100. That is the kind of voting record that the squad members of the squad have. It's the kind of voting record you might see, for example, in downtown Minneapolis or downtown Seattle. It is not the kind of voting record that represents Wenatchee or East Wenatchee or Ellensburg or even places in, in King County like Auburn or Kent. And she has not been able to show any level of independence in that role. And I'll tell you what, people want their Congress man or woman to reflect the value systems within the district. And so that's one of the biggest reasons why I ran. It's not personal, it's policy. And uh, and so there's, it's no surprise then that I'm, I'm leading her in the polls already head to head by 4%. Of course, beating all the other Republicans in the race by a greater than two to one mar uh, margin outside the margin of error. Uh, and uh, it helps to be known in King County if you wanna take over a big seat. But I really look forward to a spirited debate because at every level, whether it's her spending and inflation, 40 year high, she's voted 100% for those tax increases, $9 trillion increased the federal debt, not deficit, debt by nearly 50%. At every level in terms of her dramatic lack of leadership uh, with respect to the criminal justice system, to see the highest murders in King County, the highest shootings in King County, to see deafening silence on the issue there is people burned down the city of Seattle and committed murders across the board. To see that uh, is really frustrating. And so that's why I bring my experience to bear as a federal prosecutor, as someone who ran President Bush's national effort to fight gun violence, as someone who has uh, represented an elected constituency and been reelected four times with an average voting percent of 65% in King County. Uh, it's gonna be fun to get up on stage and debate with her, really talk about the consequences of her actions because uh, failed policies have real effects, and I think it's exactly why you're starting to see an increase in crime and homelessness uh, there in Chelan County is because of the failed policies that are spreading from the city of Seattle. Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt we're seeing uh, a lot of that spilling over the hill. This race becomes uh, even more important because it's certainly one of the races that may determine the control of the House. And at this point, the Democrats have the House. They were tied in the Senate. They, for all practical purposes, have complete control. And so far, the results have been uh, pretty much disastrous uh, at every level. And uh, so uh, is this, does this race really factor in? Are you considered one of those folks that can turn that around? Yeah, well, it's a top 10 race across the United States. I was just back in D.C. Uh, last, as late as last night. Uh, I met with uh, Congressman Tom Emmer, who is the chair of the NRCC. We had a good, long, hour-long one-on-one meeting. I met with Steve Scalise, who is the minority whip. 
I met with lots of different members of Congress, all of whom are supporting me, and and uh, and they know that the Congress doesn't flip control unless we win here in the 8th Congressional. And we don't win here in the 8th Congressional unless Chelan and Kittitas County step up to the plate and turn out the way we know they can turn out. I can battle Kim Schreier in King County. That's what I'm good at. But what I need is the icing on the cake, that little extra push in the back to get across the line that Chelan and Kittitas County can provide. And if I am elected, of course, I will have a district office in central Washington that will be staffed more than one hour a week, will be there actively. And of course, I have a home in central Washington, which is important as well. But uh, this is ground zero. This could be a $20 million race for Congress. And uh, we're going to we're going to see it at all levels. It's going to be brutal. And, and uh, at the end of the day, we hope to uh, emerge victorious. You mentioned uh, spending, and of course, this is a concern for all of us. The deficits are now at thirty trillion, or the debt, I should say. And I, yes, you mentioned that debt versus deficits. We're still running deficits, but we're at a thirty trillion dollar debt. That's an amazing number, and the inflation uh, just reported uh, before this show uh, was uh, filmed: seven point five percent inflation, the highest in forty two years. And we've got a labor shortage, a supply chain crisis. I mean, how do you, where do you go? How do you deal with all this? This is a lot to deal with. Can the Republicans, if they get back in control, turn this thing around, or are we too far down the pipe? Well, I'm confident America has the ability to rebound. Uh, and the policy fixes can all be summarized really in one sentence stop spending money, <laughs> yeah. start enforcing the law. Start holding people accountable for their choices, uh, and uh, with respect to you know very generally the economy and inflation, which is maybe the top issue. I mean, look at gas prices. I was just back east in Virginia. That's a buck less a gallon than it is right here in Washington State. Look at grocery prices. Look on the shelves. There's huge sections of those shelves there uh, that are 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 not having groceries on them. Take a look at vehicles, 46% you want to buy a used car uh, anymore, 7.5% nationally. King County is over 8% in terms of inflation. So, you know, if you were making $40,000 a year, 8%, you know, that's a, what is that, four grand? And not quite three, $3,500, you just got a pay cut. You don't know what you just did by operation of the economy. So that's one. Kim Schreier's got a spending problem. Uh, and uh, you, you see it. And uh, that $10 trillion is, is on her. And what have we, let me ask this question. What have we got for that, by the way, that 10 trillion? Yeah, like a lot of inflation. <laughs> yeah, a lot of inflation. You, you actually, it, it, it tends to make things worse. These four little kids are the reason I'm doing this. We've got a 12 year old, a nine year old, a six year old and a three year old. Uh, so we are right in the middle of this fight. Uh, and like a lot of people, Gary, I don't recognize this state anymore, uh, frankly, even more so after 2020. Um, but, but it's taken a turn for the worse in the, in the past decade. And I don't think any Republican, uh, most even non-Republicans would say they don't recognize what's going on here. You know, we've got problems. Uh, yeah. They seem to be getting worse, not better. And that's it's, a, it's a shame. And that's what got me into the race for attorney general uh, uh, three years ago when I jumped into that race against Bob Ferguson. Uh, we've seen skyrocketing crime, homelessness, drug abuse. All of these things are out of control. And as I went to all the counties in the state in my race for AG, uh, I learned something. And that it's not just King County and Pierce County and Snohomish County that are having these problems. You're them in the Tri Cities, uh, in Spokane, in Walla Walla, in Bellingham, in Vancouver, all over the state, they're experiencing the same things. And it's it's a tragedy to me because I'm so proud of this place, uh, and I want my four kids to be as proud of this state as I am. Uh, but we're just not headed in the right direction. Uh, so we've got to get these things under control. And that's why I jumped into this race. Um, you know, it's too bad I won the primary. I had a tough primary in my AG race. We we, we kicked some butt in that race and, and did well and took the fight to Bob Ferguson all the way to November. It's a shame it didn't fall the way we wanted it. But uh, I often, in fact, just the other day, I was talking to my wife and I, we were complaining about the mandates and the vaccine requirements and the mask requirements and all of the repression that we're seeing from our government. Uh, and I said, do you know how different this state would look if I had been elected to attorney general in 2020? 
we would have been suing King Inslee at every single turn uh, and fighting back against the stuff and fighting back against his unending emergency powers. Uh, and the state would have looked radically different the last two years. Uh, but it wasn't to be. And, and the next calling that we had as we prayed about this as a family was United States Congress. Uh, this is a, a big race. It's a big seat. And we can make a big difference once I win this race. Well, I'll tell you, there's a lot of work to do at both levels. The state of Washington is a mess, and Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. is a mess. Uh, it's good to know that you've had some experience back there. It's not an easy mm -hmm. place to get into and navigate. It takes time. Yeah. And so the fact that you've been there, it certainly helps. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, this primary coming up. You've got uh, two competitors. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, you know what? Before I go to that, let's, let's hold on that a minute. I want to talk about your priorities. We have, as you said, a number of problems from immigration down the line. It's just amazing, the crime problem. But let's, mm -hmm. uh, let's get your priorities. If you get to Congress, what are, what are your priorities, the top, say, top three or four? Top three or four, there's just, you know what? There's uh, so many, there's, I know. There's so many, and every day is a new gift from President Biden that we have to fix. Uh, he, he, he gives us a new problem to solve. Uh, but priorities are, are number one, just in, in general, bringing conservative principles to D.C. The eighth doesn't have that right now. It's represented by Kim Schreier, who's a radical leftist. She is, and she could say she's not, but her voting record shows otherwise. Uh, she's a 100% vote with Nancy Pelosi, 97% uh, with AOC. Uh, AOC just wrote her a campaign donation check not too long ago. Um, that tells you where she's at. These are not 8th District values. So bringing the conservative uh, leadership back to Congress is a big priority of mine. And that encompasses a lot of different things, Carrie. That's, that means being tough on the border, um, which is number one priority for me. Being Sealing up our southern border will solve a lot of our problems, especially when the ones we're seeing in the 8th. Uh, it will it will stem the drug flow into our communities. It will uh, slow down the crime that we're seeing spread. Uh, it will do a lot of things to help the eighth, to help Washington State. And frankly, the the added benefit of running for Congress uh, is that you not only get to help Washington State, you get to help the other 49 states with the policies that you come up with. Uh, and and that's exciting too. Although my focus is really on Washington State because that my heart is. Uh, but there's got to be conservative priorities. Uh, and a lot of those things, like lowering taxes, like supporting the lives of the unborn, uh, these are things that are important to me. Um, like I said, sealing up the southern border, being tough on crime, uh, all of these things. In fact, I, I came up with a campaign slogan uh, maybe six months ago, make crime illegal again. <laughs> uh, and, and it got national press, Gary. We got national traction. Uh, Fox News called and did a whole piece just on my candidacy for Congress. I've been on Fox News now three or four times, uh, Newsmax, and they're all covering it because of this issue that we're seeing out here in Washington State. They want to talk about make, making crime illegal again and about my race. And it's been great, but it's also sad. It's sad that they're not calling me to tell them how wonderful Washington is and how beautiful the mountains and, and the Puget Sound are. And they want to talk about how terrible things are out here, because frankly, they're pretty bad. Uh, <laughs> well, Seattle and, certainly uh, uh, set an example for the rest of the United States. What a sure. mess. Yeah, so really, I think the, the best way to summarize who I am and, and our candidacy is to say servant leadership. You know, I, I grew up in rural America, the son of a pastor. Uh, grew up, you know, shopping at the dented can store. Uh, Carrie, I didn't know that cans came undented until I was like 15 years old. Uh, we, we lived in the manse. I thought it was a mansion. Turns out that's just where they put the pastor because uh, they can't afford to, to pay him enough, right? Uh, and so I ended up going to Boys State and Boys Nation, both American Legion programs. And I met uh, President Bush and, you know, a couple leaders from the state where I was living at the time, South Dakota. But uh, it wasn't until I met Congressman Thune, I was really impressed with, you know, sort of servant leadership. Uh, he inspired me and ended up going to, to work for him in D.C. and became his driver. And I drove him to Walter Reed Medical Institute. I remember very vividly to this day in 2007. We met a young man who sadly had stepped on an IED and lost one of his legs, was catastrophically burned. And all he wanted to do was go back to Iraq and be with his guys. And that was it's really a pivotal moment for me. Uh, three months later, I had enlisted uh, and was uh, at basic training at, at uh, Columbia, South Carolina. 
Fort Jackson, the same military installation my grandfather deployed to World War II from. I ended up becoming an infantry officer, uh, became Ranger qualified infantry uh, airborne, went to the 173rd, a, a really storied unit there where I served with a Congressional Medal of Honor recipient. Uh, and I went on a full year combat uh, tour to Afghanistan. And there was, you know, start to, to learn, you know, some of the, the key principles that I carry with me every day. You know, community policing was one of them. We, you know, uh, worked well with the village elders and actually had a, an elder tell me, hey, there's an IED on the route that you're going to travel. Uh, and we were able to call uh, EOD out and defuse the situation, defuse the bomb. Uh, and that was because we engaged and we, you know, had good positive relationships. And that's what the police do for us every single day. And of course, we'll talk about this more later, I'm sure, but Kim Schreier wants to defund them and refuses to condemn the defund the police movement. So, you know, I came back from that full year combat tour with the 173rd and felt, you know, compelled to, to try out for, for another level of service for Joint Special Operations Command. Uh, of course, I always joke that everybody knows, and you've heard this joke, Kerry, so you're contractually obligated to laugh still, uh, that everybody knows who uh, Delta Force is because they have Chuck Norris. Uh, and everybody knows who SEAL Team 6 is because you get a publicist when you graduate from BUDS to help you write a book. Uh, I was part of the other group, uh, Ranger Regiment, and I uh, know I don't know Smokey the Bear, uh, but I did go on 75 uh, high-value night raid targets, much like the Bin Laden raid, uh, earned two bronze stars for service while I was there as part of Joint Special Operations Command. Uh, got out in 2014, uh, ended up going to Columbia Business School where I got my MBA. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think tenacity is a requirement and fundamental. Uh, to, to being a member of Congress. When I tried out for Joint Special Operations Command, I actually ran on a stress fracture until I broke my leg. Likewise, when I got into Columbia, uh, I got in on the on the sort of uh, special category, like, hey, you need some remedial math. We'll, we'll, we'll accept you, but we really need to make sure that you know what you're doing here. And I graduated on the dean's list because, you know, I, I may not be the smartest guy in the room, but I'm the one that works the hardest. Uh, I ended up getting a very successful career in the private sector, worked for uh, tech companies, Microsoft, Amazon, I uh, work for Zillow now, but uh, I really had another call to service moment in, in 2020, in 2019, actually, uh, when a good friend of mine, sadly, uh, a military friend, chose to take his own life. And it wasn't the first time that had happened, but it was another wake up call. And I looked around and saw that there just wasn't the servant leadership. There wasn't uh, the sort of service and taking care of our veterans and other communities uh, that were just being left behind. Uh, and so, you know, I started talking and we ended up running in uh, in 2020, and boy, did we outperform expectations. We got 48.2% of the vote. Uh, I spent $600,000 in the general. Uh, Kim Schreier spent three and a half million in that race. I was outspent six to one, uh, and we came within a couple thousand votes of, of winning. And you know that was with in a very tough year for Republicans. Uh, and you know we've been asked to to run again this time here in 2022 by Attorney General Rob McKenna, who's endorsed us, Pierce County Executive. Uh, uh, Bruce Danmeyer, of course, we've got the endorsements of Brian Burnett out there in Chelan County and uh, uh, the Kittitas County Sheriff as well. So, you know, it was kind of addressed by those guys to take another run at it here. And this this go around in 2022, we're just in a, a really different situation where uh, Kim Schreier went to D.C., became an insider and became an insider trader. And again, I'm sure we'll talk more about that. But we really believe that uh, in this time of national crisis that there's more that needs to be done, and it needs to be done by someone who's willing to be a fighter. And, you know, even in, in the campaign, uh, I kind of hit the pause button, uh, stopped campaigning full time and, and started a group called Task Force Argo. And uh, with that group of 100 veterans or 150 veterans, uh, we actually rescued over 2,633 Afghans from Afghanistan, including 61 American citizens, uh, despite uh, a lot of uh, blockage, believe it or not, from the Department of State. And so I think that we need somebody that's willing to step up and actually get something accomplished. I think that we need somebody that has a private sector background that can help uh, fight this inflation that is out of control, 40-year high inflation brought on uh, by the crazy Democratic spending priorities uh, that they knew was going to raise inflation because the San Francisco Fed and the Chicago Fed told them so, and Kim Schreier ignored it. Uh, so we need someone that's willing to stand up and fight willing to actually get something done and willing to be a servant leader. And in this election cycle with incredibly high inflation, with uh, a national disgrace uh, in, in the leadership that we see from the Biden administration leading directly, I would argue, to the war in Ukraine, we need someone who's actually been shot at. We need someone who's willing to be a servant leader and willing to be a fighter. And we're going to take the tailwind that we see here this go around and we're going to take this seat back. All right.
Hey. Well, uh, so, let's talk uh, just briefly. We've got about a minute here before the break uh, about this district. They, it has been redistricted. Do you feel more comfortable in this district than in the prior uh, district? It, it looks to me like it's moved a little bit towards the Republicans. Uh, is that a benefit for you this time around? Yeah, so we have a, you know, it's a, it was a D plus one last election cycle and it was a D plus one this time. So that's the sort of rating system on a generic ballot. It's 51% would vote for the Democrat. Have to kind of explain the, the inside baseball there a little bit. But yes, to your point, Kerry, I do think that this actually became a little bit better for the Republicans. And this election cycle, the DCCC is telling any Democrat in a D plus 12 to run scared. Uh, in other words, the Biden is so toxic uh, that if you're even in a, a D plus 12, you're at risk of losing your seat. And so, you know, Kim Schreier, I'm sure, is very concerned, and she should be, based off the polling that I've seen. Welcome back. Well, there you have it. All three contenders, uh, all qualified, all experienced. It's going to be a very interesting primary, as I've said. We mustn't forget, though, that we also have other elections going on. The 12th District, uh, Keith and Mike, both of your state House uh, representatives are up for a, a re-election this year. Of course, again, the local commissioner's race on this side as well as the other side will be important. There is a lot going on and we intend to cover it all in the next few weeks. Stay with us on the 12th District. In the meantime, don't forget our news at 5, 6, and 10 o'clock. We'll see you next week with more business and political information right here on the 12th District.